So in the last couple of messages, then, we were looking at the twofold subject of authority and apostolicity in the writings of the New Testament canon. Tonight we're going to be looking at three more subjects, the writing, the circulation, and the collection of the epistles of the New Testament canon, the, the circulation and the collection of them. We did this under the Old Testament canon and getting together some references from the Old Testament to picture in our own minds exactly what is going on at this time. And for the most part, especially among the prophets, you've got the Old Testament authors sometimes speaking orally and then writing, sometimes writing and then speaking later. It was different for different prophets, but speaking on behalf of the sins of the people of Israel and then writing or writing on behalf and then speaking out on behalf of the sins of Israel. And then this was gathered together, collected together, and put into a final form. The Mosaic writings, not against sin, but recording the institutional laws by which the nation of Israel was to be governed. And you go through all the books and find out different reasons for what's going on in the area of the writing of the Old Testament books. So we have to do the same for the New Testament writings, the New Testament manuscripts, and that is the actual authorship of them, the sitting down and the writing of these. If you look over in Luke chapter 16, you need to understand that for the first decade and a half of the Christian church's existence, they had no New Testament writings. They had none until the earliest epistle to be written, and that wasn't until 15 years after the foundation of the church. So for the first decade and a half, the Christians, and remember for the most part, they're Jewish Christians, it takes a good while to get the gospel outside of the confines of Palestine, and even longer to get it all the way into Asia Minor and Greece and Italy, and then finally Paul talks about going all the way to Spain, which practically for the map of the Mediterranean is at the other side of the world compared to Palestine. And that took a little while to get Gentile converts all over the place. So there's no need, in other words, for a lot of New Testament writing. But they still have to have instruction. Where do they get their instruction? Well, there was a twofold source on where the early Christians received their biblical instruction. The first of those two sources was the Old Testament. Jesus and the apostles in the Gospels went around preaching from the Old Testament went around basing his life and ministry upon the Old Testament, went around basing his passion upon the fulfillment of Old Testament prophecies. So you can see before you even get to the period of the composition of New Testament material, just the acting out of what we have in the Gospels was done upon the basis of Old Testament prophecy and of Old Testament writing. Therefore, after the ascension of Christ, we're certainly still going to have a great emphasis placed upon the Old Testament as being at least one source of instruction for the Christians. Now, they're enlightened. Most of them are Jews. They're enlightened on the Old Testament. Where'd they get that enlightenment? Well, that's the second source that we'll get to in a moment. But Luke 16 and verse 29, Jesus is talking before anything has been written in the New Testament canon, but he makes reference to the first of these two sources where the early Christians could have obtained their instruction for the first decade and a half, and of course, then on out. Luke 16, this is the account of uh, the rich man. In Lazarus, verse uh, 29, Abraham saith unto the rich man, who's in torment and who's concerned a little bit too late about his five brethren, it's time to believe for household salvation now and not in the afterlife. Uh, you, like this fellow, you can't be praying for them after you're dead now. And <clears throat> you can't be praying for them after they're dead. Abraham saith unto him, They have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. <laughs> 
Old Testament, Moses and the prophets. Remember, that was the way of saying the Old Testament. They have the Old Testament. Let them hear that. And over in John 5 and verse 39, Jesus said what? Search the scriptures. For in them you think you have eternal life, and they are they which testify of me. But what does he say? Search the scriptures. Now, if he's, if he's saying that, not writing, but if he's saying that to <clears throat> religious leaders and Jews of his day who, of course, aren't believers in his life and ministry and his calling, then how much more would that be true for Christians after the ascension? To search the scriptures. It was the command for the Old Testament Jews that were living in the New Testament period but weren't believing in Jesus Christ. In order to check out what he was saying, search the scriptures. You look over in Galatians chapter 4 and verse 21. Paul writing now to Christians, probably for the most part Jewish Christians, since they're having a problem with Judaism and the Judaizers, but no doubt there were some Gentiles there. Paul says, you that desire to be under the law, don't you hear what the law says? Galatians 4. In other words, He's recommending that they go back to the Old Testament, to the law, to Genesis is what he's talking about, and read some. Those that desire to be under the law, he said, don't you hear what the law is saying? In other words, you've got an implication of a basis for their instruction, that's the Old Testament. But the primary one is in Acts 17 and verse 11. Well, we can take verse 10 along with verse 11. The brethren immediately sent away Paul and Silas by night unto Berea, who coming thither went into the synagogue of the Jews. Now, do you know whether or not we have any New Testament writings available by the time of Acts 17.10? Amen. Well, yeah, we do. These were more noble, but obviously you don't have very many. I mean, Paul's right in the middle of living out Acts, so Acts couldn't have been written by then. A lot of things are written after Acts, so there's not that much uh, written material that's available. These were more noble than those in Thessalonica in that they received the word, that is the preached word, the audible vocal word, with all readiness of mind, and searched the scriptures daily, whether those things were so. Now, what scriptures did they search? The Old Testament. This was the, now these are Jews here, but they've received so far... According to what Luke says, they receive with all readiness of mind Paul's Christian interpretation of the Old Testament. Oh, there are a lot of Jews that still read the Old Testament today, but not like we read the Old Testament. We read the Old Testament with a Christian interpretation put upon it. I mean, if you read it any other way, you end up with Judaism, and that's not going to save you. You don't have any hope if you're a Gentile and you try to convert to Judaism, you've got to go, if anything, to Christianity because no matter what you do, you'll still never be a natural Jew by birth, which means you're not a Jew as far as God's concerned. So no, you wouldn't get into the kingdom like the Jews might get into it these last days. But anyway, searching the scriptures daily was their command, and that was what they were doing as far as the Old Testament was concerned. Now, a second source for their instruction and this is where they got their Christian interpretation of the Old Testament, was the apostolic oral teaching and preaching. Acts 2.42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. I mean, they couldn't be gathering together like we are here tonight and everyone have your own private version of any type of Bible, whether it be old or new. But especially... You couldn't be looking up Acts 17. They didn't have Acts 17 then. You didn't have the luxury that we have now of just carrying around a Bible. And when it says that they searched the Scriptures daily here, that still doesn't mean everyone had a private scroll at home. That obviously was an impossibility. And historically we know that wasn't true. They were doing that there at the synagogue. And you had an official reader and keeper of the scrolls there and you'd all have to go and find out things from him. And it was only a very few people who had their own scrolls. And even if you had your own, you wouldn't have all 22 of them. You'd just probably have one or two of them, or just a part of one or two of them. You certainly wouldn't have all of them. But even if they had some Old Testament scrolls, where do they get their Christian understanding? 
Well, Acts 2.42, they continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. And then a verse we haven't used before over in John 17 and verse 20. Two sources of instruction for the first decade and a half before they have any New Testament writing. The Old Testament, the apostles' oral teaching. John 17, 20, Neither pray I for these alone, but for them also, listen to what he says, which shall believe on me through their word through the apostles' word, the apostolic oral preaching and teaching. It's the same as what's recorded. That's why they continued steadfastly in it over in Acts 2.42. Because Jesus says the only way they're going to believe on me is they're going to believe on me through you, through the word that you've preached unto them, because I'm not going to be around anymore. So the only way they're going to be able to believe on me is to believe on me through the word that you're preaching. And that's why Acts 2.42 becomes so important. Now, the classic details of the gospel, such as Jesus' birth, a few things about his life, and more than anything else, his death, his burial, and his resurrection became so popularized by people telling and retelling and retelling the story. You can't look it up, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It, it's carried on by word of mouth that you got from the apostles. It is told so often that all of the Christians end up memorizing the details of the gospel, and it assumes a more or less stereotyped form. If you look over in the passage where we've looked before in 1 Corinthians 15, you can see how succinctly it's stated as though it's in a stereotyped form because it's been repeated so very often. Not that Paul got it from someone else's repetition. We dealt with that in an earlier message. But that this is the acceptable classic details of Jesus life and the form of them 1st Corinthians 15 3 to 4 and people have noticed this before how the whole gospel story is stated in such a brief period of verses in just really the end of verse 3 how that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures now, according to the scriptures is the Old Testament instruction. That he died for our sins is the apostolic teaching. How do, how do we know that someone came along and fulfilled the Old Testament scriptures, the prophecies, until the apostles came and taught Jesus' passion? Verse 4, well, verse 3, he died for our sins, and that he was buried, and that he rose again the third day according to the scriptures. Now, that's not very doctrinally... Uh, explanatory it's very brief in just three short phrases he died he was buried and he rose again on the third day Amen. and the Christians they can't look this up anywhere but it becomes a stereotype form that he died he was buried and he rose from the dead the third day all according to the scriptures and no doubt the ascension would be tacked on for Paul's talking about the resurrection in chapter 15, so that's why he stops with the resurrection on the third day. He doesn't need to go on to the ascension. But no doubt that would be put in there, so you would have the death, the burial. You have to, he has to die, make sure he's dead, and not someone else substituted in his place, like some of the early heretics were saying, that Jesus was really a phantom on the cross, and he got down and someone else got up there when no one was looking and died in his place rather than him as substitution dying in our place, but they've got to have the death, make sure he's dead, make sure he's buried, because you've got to have all the miraculous things about the burial. You know, he's in there, he doesn't stink, he doesn't corrupt in the tomb. Yeah. There's a big stone rolled across it so that no one can get to him, so the disciples can't steal his body. In the third place, he rose from the dead. On the third day, that was very important to fulfill Old Testament type concerning the prophet Jonah, and he ascended back into heaven. Now, along the way, here and there, various short narratives of the life of Christ, not about death, burial, resurrection. That was stereotyped and memorized by all the Christians. But what about the time Jesus, uh, you know, cast a demon out of someone? I mean, just scores of times that the uh, gospel writers don't even tell us about. And John tells us that he doesn't even, couldn't. It would be impossible, he said, to even begin to tell you half of what he did. But he said, these are written so that you can believe on the name of the Son of God. 
and have life in him. But here and there, various short narratives, some of them which in, ended up in our canon of Scripture, no doubt a lot of it which never ended up in our canon of Scripture, were popping up here and there by different early eyewitnesses. Remember, Jesus had more than just the 11 apostles. He had 70 disciples that he sent out. Now, we don't find them apostatizing later on or something. There are 70. And then that doesn't count all the women that followed him. And so how many times do you think they saw things in his own life which would, we would include under the, the narrative of the life of Christ? And they passed on to others, I remember I saw Jesus do that, or I heard him teach this parable. They didn't have all this written down like we have. It was just passed on word of mouth. That's why we're getting to all this. There was a need to get it down in writing because it just gets spread all over the place. And you know what it's like when you've told a story 1,500 times. Accidentally, things just slip in there. But things were spread along from one place to another that early eyewitnesses had seen or had heard, seen him do as, as far as some miracle is concerned or heard him teach in one of his teachings or in a parable of his. And these things were picked up by early disciples and committed to memory as well. Now, as these converts were made outside of Jerusalem, after chapter 8, remember, of the book of Acts, the church begins to expand up into Samaria in accordance with what Jesus had said in Acts 1-8. It'll be Jerusalem first, then it'll be Judea and Samaria, Acts 8-13, to and then it'll be into the uttermost part of the earth, Acts 13-28. to So as the church begins to spread out, through the apostolic labors, new churches are formed all around the Mediterranean Sea. Disciples are being made that are Gentiles and not Jews, and therefore they don't have Old Testament study. And they aren't in Palestine, so they don't have the luxury of picking up all these details that maybe a lot of eyewitnesses, even if they weren't believers, would remember about the life and ministry of Jesus Christ while he were here. Then they're going to be at a disadvantage. And so it's with all this in mind that we come up with the early need of putting some things down in writing. And we see several important reasons behind at least the writing of the epistles, which were so very, very important for the early church. The gospel story, which we'll get to in a moment, the gospel story, a lot of it anyway, as I've been saying, was memorized by people. But when it came to the epistles, we're dealing with doctrinal material now, that for the most part, the Apostle Paul, writing 14 of them as he did, got by special revelation. And the problems that the people were having in the local assemblies were not things about the gospel of Christ, but about doctrinal issues, as well as practical, but that had nevertheless a doctrinal basis in their local assembly. And so we see several reasons for the need of writing the New Testament material. The first place to answer questions of local concern, whether it be practical concern or doctrinal concern. And even if it's practical, it has to be based upon doctrine anyway. Some of the epistles fit this bill. 1 Corinthians 1 and verse 11. To answer questions of local concern, Paul says, For it hath been declared unto me of you, my brethren, by them which are of the house of Chloe, that there are contentions among you. Questions of local concern in the local assembly at Corinth. And that's what's prompting at least one thing, 1 Corinthians. Then chapter 7 and verse 1. Now concerning the things whereof he wrote unto me, they're writing him a letter to get the response of First Corinthians that we have. And their letter concerns those questions of local problems that have arisen. The book of James, also written with the concern of questions of these local groups of Christians. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 2. Not all of Philippians was written, but here Paul deals with a local problem in Philippians 4, 2. 
Okay, a second reason for the writing would be to correct error. An example, the book of Galatians, to correct error that was spreading among the churches of Galatia. Derby, Lystra, Iconium, and so forth, depending on whether you hold to South or North Galatian theory. And then a third reason would be to warn of heretics. 2 Peter chapter 2, and then the whole epistle of 2 John, and the whole epistle of Jude, was written to warn the Christians of early heretics. Thus we see that the apostles generally had a specific reason, which I think we mentioned last time, they generally had a specific reason when they sat down and wrote an epistle. And we dealt with this earlier. No, they were not trying to be a counterpart to the Old Testament prophets in saying, well, let's write a New Testament canon, New Testament Bible now. Generally, they sat down with a specific thing in mind, and it was one of these things that I just mentioned. Now, Jude verse 3 sets this forth very clearly, where Jude had two subjects, one of them that eventually overrode the other one, which caused him eventually to write his epistle, but another subject to even take the thought of sitting down and beginning to write. But he changed his mind. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, that it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that ye should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered unto the saints. Well, who do you contend against? Well, heretics. That's why he listed Jude under the problem of heresy. For there are certain men crept in unawares who were before of old ordained to this condemnation, ungodly men turning the grace of our God into lasciviousness and denying the only Lord God and our Lord Jesus Christ. And then he goes on, I will therefore put you in remembrance. And he goes on to remind them from Old Testament examples what God does to those who hear the truth and then eventually turn away from it. Now even though... Most of the epistles are directed toward particular concerns, whether it's a heretical concern or just a practical question that the assembly might have when addressing the apostle. The apostolic writers were so supernaturally guided, and this is one of the most phenomenal things about the character of the New Testament, especially the epistles. The New Testament authors were so supernaturally guided that Everything they put down in writing covers to a T everything the church would ever need to know. In other words, all of our problems and all of our questions concerning heretics, concerning error, uh, concerning local problems, whether they are practical or doctrinal, have all been dealt with in the Holy Scriptures in the New Testament. That's a phenomenal aspect of the character of the New Testament. How someone like in 1 Corinthians could be writing Paul and saying, now we've got a problem in this area, in this area, in this area. And the response of Paul, although it's directed initially toward a literal historical group of people at Corinth, nevertheless that response fits so well questions of similar nature that have arisen since that time, all the way, I might add, down until our day. And now one epistle won't do it. That's why you have all of them. You have all of them. You put all of them together. And they all deal with all these various things that we need to know. Most of our teaching, with the exclusion of the book of Acts, concerning the New Testament assembly and its ministry comes from letters that Paul wrote to individuals. We call them the pastoral epistles, First and Second Timothy and Titus, but they were written to individual men. Or where you get your qualifications for leadership in the church. You get it from 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1. Yeah. And what about the widows? You don't find that anywhere in the Bible, but in 1 Timothy chapter 5. You can't take a widow into the number under three score years of age. It talks about young widows. It's better for them to go ahead and marry, Paul said. Old widows, or, yeah, old widows don't marry. Young widows, go ahead and marry. What about Timothy's relationship to those that are around him? Uh, gifts of the Spirit come up several times there. Even the conduct of those in the local assembly, Titus chapter 2, the first half of that chapter deals exclusively with that. And it's interesting that it's written to an individual, but it answers all the problems of ecclesiology 
that men have invented their own doctrines and traditions about. And so we've gotten cardinals and, and popes and bishops and nuns and priests, and that's not anywhere in the pastoral epistles. Now, some things you don't have there. You've got, to, you've got to go over to 1 Corinthians 12 and Ephesians 4 and get fivefold ministry there. But you've got a lot of it right in the pastoral epistles. Supernaturally guided so that everything that would need to be covered was put down in writing. Now, as time went along, because the Gospels came a little bit later than the early epistles. Now, there were epistles that came after the Gospels. But as time went along, the occasion also arose for the need of dependable written accounts of the earthly life of Christ because certain people remembered only certain parts about his life and they would spread this mouth to mouth from one witness to another witness and then that person would share it with someone else and since the elementary parts of the gospel story the passion the death, the burial, the resurrection, the ascension of Christ were already stereotyped and memorized by just about everyone then it took a little while before there was even a need for a gospel. They were the, the memory. I mean, just study the book of Acts, the first few chapters. The memory of Christ was so profound in the minds of the early Christians, they didn't need to read Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. They were living a daily reality and experience with him every day. And they had been taught by the apostles, by those that had been with him, what he was like in his life and what, he's taught, what he taught. But as time went on, and we get a little later, a few decades later, then there arose the need for dependable written accounts for the earthly life of Christ. And this is how the Gospels came about. And then shortly thereafter, this is how Acts came about because there was the need for a dependable account of the history of the early church where you've got people that are saved 25 years later how did the church begin? Well, there was a need for an official document written, inspired by the Holy Spirit. Although Luke addresses it to Theophilus, God intends for it to be the primary document for first century Christianity because it is the only reliable one. And so as a result, we have the Gospels and we have Acts coming about. That only leaves us with Revelation, which was in a class by itself because it was predicting future events that the church would need to know in order to be aware of the times in which she happened to be. So whenever one of these things happened, either a question of local concern was brought before the mind of the apostles or the problem of heir or heretics, or when we get later with the Gospels and Acts, just the need for a reliable historical documentary account of the life of Christ or the life of the early church then the apostles would sit down inspired by the Holy Spirit and we don't have a whole picture of what they felt like when they got up the morning they began to write but we have enough information if people just won't get too curious and get off and when people do get off into curiosity they start inventing things that they don't have any historical or scriptural basis for like to try to figure out why are the Gospels so silent? This was one of the big problems in the second century, not the first century. But why were the Gospels so silent about the boyhood of Christ? What was going on in his life there? We only have one thing, and that's when he was 12 years old, and that is all. And then what about from there until the age 30? Nothing. And so the second century, we had some more spurious Gospels written to fill in all the details. Why? People got curious. They were too long past the early witnesses like Mary, the mother of Jesus, so that they could find out directly and reliably. Now, what happened in Jesus when he was a child? What was he like? Or from 12 to 30. We know he was a carpenter and the son of a carpenter, which is an interesting vocation to have. But what was he doing during that time? You see, by the second century, everyone has forgotten essentially what was going on then. The only thing that is remembered, that is reliable, is what's been written down. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John had just been written a few decades before, and then the book of Acts for the history of the early church. So people begin to fill in the details. It's important not to get too curious about things we're not given any information about. And one of those things is we don't know what the disciples felt like when they got up and began to get anointed and inspired to write one of those epistles or one of those gospels. 
Right. Did they have a vision or, you know, what was it? Were they taken to the third heaven? We don't know. But it's none of our business. We don't need to know. We've got their writings, and that's what's important. Now, one thing that was frequent among writers outside of the New Testament canon, I just mean Greek writers of that era, and that we see taking place on a, at least a couple of occasions in the New Testament canon, was the employment of an amanuensis. We've got one example over in Romans chapter 16 and verse 22. And some of you may not have ever noticed these before. We're talking right now about the writing of the epistles. And we'll get into more of the mechanics of it. That's a dangerous word to use when you're talking about this subject. I think I remember myself saying that recently, mechanics, and I'll explain why some other message. But we'll get in more into the mechanics of what's going on when we study the inspiration of Scripture. That's a dangerous word to use when you're talking about this subject. I think I remember myself saying that recently, mechanics, and I'll explain why some other message. But we'll get in more into the mechanics of what's going on when we study the inspiration of Scripture. Because there you're dealing with the mind and the spirit of the writer receiving the material and getting it down in writing. Now all we're concerned about is the historical <laughs> aspect of that, not the supernatural, spiritual aspect of that. And so one historical literary fact concerning the writing of the New Testament epistles was that an amanuensis was often employed by the author of sacred scripture. And what we mean by that is that the person who served as an amanuensis would more or less fulfill the capacity of a secretary or of a scribe. Now what I don't want to get off into is, is how did the apostle get the material and then give it to his scribe in such a way that there was no leaving out anything or no adding anything between the apostle and his scribe. We'll look at that later. And not in this class, another class. But all we want is verse 22. Now we know this is Romans. We know Paul wrote Romans. Well, did he really? <laughs> I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, salute you in the Lord. Paul didn't write the epistle to the Romans. Now, Paul is the one we could call who's the author of it because it's his material. But who did the actual writing by a pen on a piece of papyrus? A man named Tertius. And sometimes the amanuensis would stick his name in there and give a salutation to those being addressed. Sometimes he wouldn't. Only on a couple of occasions do we have it in the New Testament. And probably it was done more than just these two times. Paul probably used an amanuensis much more frequently than Romans 16, 22 would let us know. Since that's the only place where we find Paul using historically and definitely an amanuensis. But here's one time, I, Tertius, who, who wrote this epistle, salute you in the Lord. So someone else wrote it for Paul, and he was what we call an amanuensis. Now, the other New Testament case is over in 1 Peter. So here we've got a different author. This is good because it lets us show that evidently it was common and frequent of that day to let others do your writing for you. Better writers, better spellers, something. Could write faster. You could concentrate better. We don't know all the whys or wherefores, but we know it did take place. 1 Peter 5. Now, he kind of ends the epistle in verse 11. To him be glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. But then verses 12 to 14 are kind of like a little postscript. By Silvanus, by, in other words, he means this epistle is by. By Silvanus, a faithful brother unto you, as I suppose I have written briefly. In other words, you have to put it in English and say the... I have written briefly by Silvanus. I have written, that is, it's my material, but Silvanus was the one who, actual, who actually did the composing of it. As I suppose I have written briefly, exhorting and testifying that this is the true grace of God wherein ye stand. So there's a second of two places in the New Testament where we see that an amanuensis was employed. 
Okay, let's move on to the second subject of circulation. The letter has the problem or the issue has come to the apostle. He's got a trusted amanuensis by him, Sylvanus, Silas, or Tertius. You've got a trusted amanuensis by you. You get the material. They write it down. Then what happens? Well, then we go into circulation. The apostolic letters would then be sent by a carrier. And these were used in secular Greek writings as well. The apostles would use a carrier, either one who ran on foot or rode on a mule or perhaps a horse, but mules were generally used for things like that. Why? They're just more reliable. You can go up and down the sides of the mountains with those mules, but not too well with those horses. Maybe not as fast as a horse, but you had months and months for your letter to get there anyway. So it would be sent by a carrier to the church or to the person who would have gotten, who would have received the letter. Romans chapter 16, and it's interesting to see, they even use females to do this. Phoebe, Romans 16, verses 1 to 2, was a carrier for the apostle Paul after Tertius had written the epistle to the Romans. Now, does that make her a fivefold minister or prophetess or apostle? Okay. No. And they jump at this. Praise God for Phoebe. She's a blessed sister here. She got to carry the great epistle of Romans to the Romans, but that doesn't make her a fivefold minister. She was one who rode a mule over there. I commend unto you Phoebe, our sister, which is a servant of the assembly, which is at Sincrea. Now, if you know anything about your geography, Sincrea is back over there near Corinth, in Greece, now what's she doing way over there in Rome where Paul says, I beseech that you receive her now? Since she is a, a slave, a servant of the assembly that is at Sincrea. Unless Paul is using her, perhaps she had some business to attend, perhaps she had relatives. We don't know, again, all the whys and wherefores on why she was going to Rome. And we don't even have to suppose she was going there. Maybe the writing of the letter was what prompted her going there that ye receive her in the Lord. So that shows that she's coming from some distant place, and we're already told Sincrea is where her local assembly is. Here again, it's one of those passages that when you really get into the New Testament and not just read through it, you get a study of what's going on, vitally speaking, in the life of the early church. She is a member of the assembly back at Sincrea, a New Testament assembly. She's traveling for the Apostle Paul. He sent her to Rome, that ye receive her in the Lord as becometh saints, and that ye assist her in whatsoever business she hath need of you, for she hath been a succor of many and of myself also. An important friend of the Apostle Paul's. She happens to be a female. That doesn't make any difference. Still, Jesus had many important friends who are women and who serve very important purposes in his ministry. So we just touch on that for emphasis sake that she was female. Uh, Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 21. If I remember correctly, that's Tychicus. Paul says, I've sent Tychicus because I'm not going to turn over there. But I believe that's Ephesians 6, 21. I believe that's Tychicus that Paul sends to let them know uh, all the affairs of his life, and of course, in going, he's not going to just tell them vocally, verbally, what's going on in Paul's life. He's going to carry the epistle to the Ephesians to them. Then another passage, 1 Corinthians 16, 17. I've got a lot more of these that we'll use in New Testament introduction when we look into this in a little more detail. Now here we've got three people. Now, we've already talked about news that came from the house of Chloe, 111 of 1 Corinthians. We've already talked about some letter that Paul got, and that means someone from Corinth had to come to wherever Paul was and give him the letter, 1 Corinthians 7, 1. Who was that? Well, we're told here, verse 17, I am glad of the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus, for that which was lacking on your part they have supplied. No doubt bringing a financial offering like generally was the case whenever one of the other churches sent someone to the apostles. It was not only for questions, but for a financial gift to his ministry. And then Paul said, fellowship with them. They have refreshed my spirit and yours. Therefore acknowledge ye them that are such. 
And so how does 1 Corinthians get back to them at Corinth? Well, probably the same three that brought the epistle in 1 Corinthians 7, 1 to Paul return with 1 Corinthians or 2 Corinthians. It would really be our 2 Corinthians back to Corinth. Very interesting. They used runners. I mean, you've got to think these things out. They didn't have a postal system. And the Apostle Paul has plenty to do just traveling around preaching. He can't run and drop letters off everywhere. So how did they get there? He had carriers, men and women, some in the ministry, some not in the ministry, that carried these letters for him to these different places. Okay, once they got there, it would be read to the whole assembly. It was a solemn occasion. You can gather from, well, we'll turn over there now, Colossians 4 was a very solemn occasion when, a, and a, when a, an epistle came from one of the apostles with the exhortation and condition contained therein that it be read among all the brethren. Colossians chapter 4 and verse 16, and evidently, this is the only hint we have specifically as we find in this one verse, the epistle would be shared with other local assemblies. When this epistle is read among you, cause that it be read also in the assembly of the Laodiceans, and that ye likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. So the next thing, once the letter gets there, it's read publicly before everyone. Then copies are made of the epistle because... Let's say that they read the epistles of one another, Colossae and Laodicea. What about next week if they want to read it again? Well, they're going to have to get their own copy of that letter. And so they're going to get their own copy, just like in the Old Testament we studied, where after a sacred scroll was written, then the Levites or the priests would make copies of that. And pretty soon it would be spread around in different parts of Palestine. The same is true here with the circulation of the letters. How were they circulated? With just one letter going to Rome? People made copies of it, and it was spread around to different assemblies as soon as they heard about what was going on. Now, depending on the distance involved in the local assembly, it would take some time for all of the epistles to end up at all of the assemblies. It took a long time, as a matter of fact, because what if you've got a church way over, well, let's say in Portugal, way over on the western coast of Spain, and they did have churches that headed right off in the area of Gaul before very long, as a matter of fact, during the first century. Now, if a letter is written to someone in Asia Minor, that's going to take some time for one little small local assembly somewhere over there in modern-day Portugal to find out that John or Peter or Jude or James or Paul or someone wrote an epistle to someone in Asia Minor and for them to get a copy of it. So the circulation was dependent upon the distance of the assembly from the mainstream of the writing of the New Testament canon, which basically was in Asia Minor, because it was easy to go from Asia Minor down to Palestine or from Asia Minor over to Greece and then another hop over the Adriatic Sea over to Rome. All right, in the third place, let's come to the collection. Now from Deuteronomy 31, verses 24 to 26, we saw that the Old Testament books were believed to be divine as soon as they were written, and therefore they were grouped together. Remember after the writing here, Moses is told to lay the scroll up by the side of the ark. As soon as it was written, in other words, there was a process of collection that began right away. They didn't just let these things disappear somewhere. The ones that did disappear, 1st and 3rd Corinthians, and Laodiceans, we've said before, did so by the providence of God. Something happened to them, and we don't know what happened to them because we don't have any copies of them down to this day, except false versions of Laodiceans that we've read to you before. Getting over into the New Testament, this, again, is the very same thing that happens. As soon as someone hears of another epistle having been written by an apostle, news has to first of all get there, then an attempt is made by that assembly to get a copy. And this is where we get our subject of collection, to get a copy of that epistle and begin to collect all of the epistles, Gospels, Acts, Revelation, the Apocalypse, whatever has been written that they've heard about, begin to make a collection of that 
copies of it, not the original, but a copy of it, but began to make a collection of that and store it in their own local assembly. Why? Because now they've got something that's a counterpart in written form that's reliable to the Old Testament. Before, they've been studying the Old Testament, and then they believe what their pastor taught them, and their pastor got it from a prophet, and the prophet got it from one of the apostles. Or maybe the teacher got it from the pastor, and the pastor got it from a prophet, and the prophet got it from the apostles. I mean, it would be pretty difficult to try to be teaching New Testament doctrine when you've got no New Testament. To be teaching Christian doctrine when although you've got the stereotype form of the gospel, you don't have all of those doctrinal portions of truth that you need to have on just how are you supposed to have and run your local assembly. Do you have communion there? Do you have love feast? Do you have the washing of the saints' feet? How do you know? How do you know that you're supposed to be doing that? Oh, you could find it in John 13. You say, John 13 wasn't written. So how do you find it then? By word of mouth until one of these things is written. And that's why they were so important because the saints believed these to be divine, authoritative, from heaven, inspired, infallible, and their rule of faith and conduct for their lives as well as for the local assembly. And over in Second Peter chapter 3, we have the earliest reference to this process of collection. The New Testament, remember, is basically giving us Christian doctrine. It doesn't go to all the trouble of giving us all the things that we're studying now, but it gives us just enough so we can fit most of the pieces of the puzzle together. Verses 15 and 16. Second Peter, chapter 3, verses 15 and 16. Here's the earliest biblical testimony to this process of collection, which obviously would enlighten you to the fact that Second Peter must be one of the later epistles. You've got to have a lot come before before you can have any period or process of collection. He says, We account that the long-suffering of our Lord is salvation, even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, as also in all his epistles. Now, how did Peter know all his epistles, a plurality of them? Unless Peter had seen a collection of those epistles at some church that he had visited. Or unless he had a collection himself that he was carrying around. How did he know all epistles? Because some of them had just been written like a few years before that. Some of them several decades before that. How did Peter know? Where does he get this term, all his epistles? Unless there has begun the period of the process of collection, the collecting of the New Testament books, just like we saw with the old. As also in all his epistles, speaking in them of those things in which are some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable as rest as they do also the other scriptures under their own destruction. Amen. Earliest biblical testimony to the process of the collection of the sacred writings of the New Testament canon continued right on through the second century after John's writings and by 30 years after the death of John the most of the New Testament books were known in most assemblies and most is the qualifying and important word 30 years after John's death the period of the process of collection had been so successful that most of the epistles were known and owned by copies of them most of the assemblies and remember we don't have churches outside of the Mediterranean world so it's still a relatively small area and space on the globe now just giving you a historical confirmation of that one of the most tremendous examples of this quick process of circulation copying collection formation of these epistles one of the most tremendous examples historically concerns the gospel of john which was written around 90 a.d now we have and i'll show you pictures of it perhaps later a portion of a manuscript known as the john rylands papyrus that was discovered not that long ago the john rylands papyrus in the rubbish heaps of Egypt. 
Remember, John lived at Ephesus, the other side of the Mediterranean, north versus south of the Mediterranean. And it has been reliably and historically dated, believe it or not, at the year A.D. 125. Remarkable. John just had written his gospel in 1890 in Ephesus. And we find it of all places in a rubbish heap. There must have been scores and scores of them available, or how did a scrap of it end up in someone's backyard trash? I mean, those things were so precious. If you only had one copy for 500 square miles, there's no way we'd ever find it ended, ending up in a rubbish heap unless there were perhaps more available than we've ever thought historians, biblical historians have ever thought before, that the process of collection and of circulation was under the direction of the Holy Spirit sped up so quickly that the epistles just went everywhere, as well as the Gospels. Now we're to the Gospel of John. Now, some books, New Testament books, had been written as much as a half a century before John. Imagine the extent of their circulation by now, when John had only written his just 35 years before this, 90 A.D. And it's been historically dated and reliably at 125 A.D. What is it? Well, it's only a couple of verses from the Gospel of John. I'll bring it to you sometime whenever we get to textual criticism and the text of the Bible later on. It's a remarkable piece, and it's still extant today. Of course, those things are priceless because that's one of the earliest pieces of the New Testament that's around. As a matter of fact, if I remember correctly, that is the earliest piece of the New Testament that's still around, something that can be dated as early as just a quarter of a century after the death of John who wrote that gospel. And that's in Egypt where we're finding it, rubbish heaps in Egypt. They were found everywhere from rubbish heaps to we'll give you a story about finding them. Crocodiles were stuffed full of biblical manuscripts. And I remember the story. It's a fascinating story. The authorities just about overlooked it because the crocodiles were just the bodies of the Nile crocodiles. <laughs> Some of you are smiling out there. Well, that's a fascinating story. We're just stuffed full of biblical manuscripts in, in the Fayum in Egypt. And that's where we got a lot of them. We got most of our manuscripts from Egypt, by the way. As a matter of fact, just about all of the early bits and pieces of papyrus that we have, since papyrus was used, first of all, came from Egypt. Okay, over the next two centuries, attempts began to be made towards some universal recognition of the correct biblical books, although this had long been settled among all the local assemblies, just like among the individual pious Israelites, it was long accepted which books were biblical and which books were not. But over the next two centuries, there were attempts made towards some universal recognition of correct biblical books, although, as I said, it had long been recognized and settled by the local assemblies. And I want to close here with several things that contributed toward this universal attempt for universal recognition of the biblical books. In the first place, we have the influence of the heretic Martian's incomplete canon dated A.D. 140, which I think we'll get to mentioning something about him in the next message, so I won't say anything about him, but Martian was probably the earliest best-known her heretic by name of the Christian faith. He had an incomplete canon. Uh, if I remember, well, I'll tell you in the next message what he contained in his canon. I remember what was in his canon. Incomplete, not the 27 biblical New Testament books that we have. And so because of his influence, which was tremendous throughout the Christian world, then there had to, someone had to attempt to get a universal official recognition of which books are biblical and which are not because many were being swayed by Marcion in his canon, which was incomplete in comparison to the New Testament canon that we eventually ended up with. Then in the second place, something else that contributed toward this attempt at universal recognition was the recognition by many Eastern leaders of post-apostolic works by placing them on the same level as the apostolic works which would make it confusing for the early Christians to know which books to believe and which not to believe. 
<coughs> to give you a couple of examples. The book of First Clement. We'll get to these in the next message. The book of First Clement was supposed by Origen, and perhaps, we're not for sure, but perhaps by Clement of Alexandria, to have been written by the Clement of Philippians 4 and verse 3. Attaching them and associating these post-apostolic writers in some way with the apostolic writers, thereby accepting their book, First Clement. This was done by Eastern leaders, Origen, and perhaps uh, Clement of Alexandria, not by the more orthodox Western leaders. Another example would be the Didache, or the other title of it is The Teaching of the Twelve Apostles, recognized as apostolic simply because of the apostolic title, which doesn't mean anything. Anyone can put a title on there and say this is the teaching of the Twelve Apostles but it carried a lot of sway in the mind of Eastern leaders during the first few decades of the second century. Then a third example would be the Shepherd of Hermas, supposed by some to have been written by the Hermas of Romans 16, 14. Because we've got biblical names, Clement and Hermas, Colossians or Philippians 4 3 and Romans 16 14 some suppose that these New Testament names were the were the same men as wrote these post apostolic works and therefore they would attribute them to be apostolic works and then a final thing that contributed toward the universal recognition was the edict of the Roman Emperor Diocletian in the year 303 very similar to that of Antiochus Epiphanes in the second century BC with regard to the Old Testament books in that it was an edict and a ban against all New Testament writings that all were to be burned and Christians burned at the stake as well who continued believing and so we've got scores no more than that we've got thousands of New Testament, now they're copies, they're not the originals, thousands of New Testament epistles, Philippians, you know, you might have 10,000 copies of Romans, but we had thousands of these burned under the edict of Diocletian in 303 A.D. And so if you're losing so many books in a hurry, you need to somehow, in a universal sense, make sure you've got standardized which books are to be in the New Testament canon and make sure you've got a copy, preserve at least one, preserved somewhere of every one of those New Testament books because Diocletian, just like Antiochus Epiphanes, made a furious attempt to destroy all Christian writings and Christian material. Didn't even come close to succeeding because people had the scrolls hidden everywhere, but went into the churches and burned the official scrolls of the assemblies. They still had them on scrolls like you'd have the Old Testament, but burned the official ones that were used at the church, burned them by the bus load and so they had to hurry up and find out now we better not let him burn our last copy of Romans or there goes Romans maybe that's what happened to Laodiceans we don't know or first or third Corinthians we don't know but we do know that they weren't passed down until today okay questions on that the writing the circulation the collection of the New Testament books <clears throat> All the writings being burned like that. Is that how we find a lot of these writings being hit all over, like the uh, Dead Sea Scrolls being hit in caves and jars like that, or is that more for protection? Okay, that's one of the reasons. Uh, Dead Sea Scrolls, you're talking about the Old Testament writings, and it, you're talking about them, some of them done in A.D. years. Some of them, Second Samuel done as early as 200 B.C. in the Dead Sea Scrolls. Some of that was for persecution. Some of it was simply the...